Welcome to Community Matters on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we'll talk to Sharon Moriwaki. We're calling this Sharon Moriwaki Speaks Out on Community Issues of Importance. Our guest for the show is, of course, Senator Sharon Moriwaki of the Hawaii State Senate. Welcome to the show, Sharon. Thank you, Jay, and thanks for having me. It's great seeing you and being here again. It's great to talk to you because uh, we need to know what's going on. Um, a lot of people don't find out until after the session is over, so this is an opportunity to tell them what happened and, um, and what the upshot is for them, for the community, for the state. So anyway, there were a bunch of bills that were passed and they were signed into law by Governor Green. Can you itemize some of the ones of, let's call it community interest? This was a banner year for us. In the six years that I've been in office in the Senate, this has got to be the best year. It's the boldest year. We made real big strides. We always keep on talking about, one, the cost of living. Well, we made significant, the biggest tax cut ever in the history of this state. Uh, we talk about um, the vulnerable not having, um, um, especially in the rural areas, not having access to doctors and dentists. Well, this year we were able to uh, exempt doctors and dentists who serve people who are Medicare, Medicaid, or TRICARE, and, and they don't have to pay taxes. So now they can serve more older people, more disabled people, more vulnerable people. And a major area of my interest, uh, the kupuna, uh, we were able to um, really focus in on the frail elderly. We, we keep on putting funding and support to keep people aging in place in their own homes, keep them healthy, exercise and so forth. But this year we focused on the other end of the spectrum. How do we keep them in their own homes? But when they can't be there, how do we keep, take care of them so that they have quality care all the way to the end days? Uh, so we, we focused on Kupuna. We also wanted to end the, the brain drain, so to speak, of people leaving the state. Uh, so we're looking at workforce development. How do we look at affordable housing and fund that so we keep people here? The talent cannot be draining out of the state. So those are major areas I see where major accomplishments were made. Of course, everybody, oh, and, and the homeless, of course, and dealing with mental health and, and substance abuse services. But all of this were, um, you know, bits and pieces along the way. But this year, bold action was taken. Money was put behind it. And this was in spite of, or despite, having to put up a billion dollars to help Lahaina recover. So that's yeah. a lot. Well, but it's a lot, but it was a lot that we did this year. And I'm so proud that we were able to get together with the House and also the governor to really get these things not only passed this year. And, and you know, he started with 14, 17 vetoes on his list. And he ended up with seven. So some of these bills that he did not veto and he signed were very significant. Oh, that's great. Well, let's uh, let's look at uh, some of them in more detailed fashion, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, you know, on the, on the content of the bill and what it provides and so forth. And I'll and I'll refer to some of the bills you just mentioned a minute ago. Let's talk first about um, housing. Let's talk about affordable housing and homelessness. Um, what provisions were passed? What bills were signed in that area? Quite a few bills. So in terms of housing, uh, we passed, um, we passed or we, we funded uh, the Hawaii H Housing Finance Development Corp uh, to the tune of something like $230 million to build infrastructure, to build housing. We also uh, funded the, the, the um, organization we created, the the statewide homeless and housing solutions office. Uh, John Mizuno now heads that. Uh, we funded them for $33 million to build up these Kauhalis that you see so successful. Now he's doing it across, across the state. Uh, we also, um, in terms of homeless, uh, looking at a lot, of, a lot of the problems when we're trying to move homeless out of the street to someplace better, uh, there, there are a lot of um, problems with mental illness, substance abuse. So we funded, um, for example, 
IHS, Institute for Human Services, uh, pilot a program that we funded last year. Uh, and they, they have a medical detox program, which is costly because you have to watch um, the wholeness and they give them the, the medication over a period of a week and a half to two weeks and and so that the, so that they get off of the drug and you and actually I've seen I've seen some of the the people that they've helped and it's it's remarkable they're like two different people so so we're trying to expand those services um, and we also funded the Department of Health the Ivy Lay Center now has uh, what they call the behavioral health crisis center where um, police or the core the um, emergency services can drop off people who are, you know, hurting themselves or others, drop them off the center, they can get assessed, they can get sent out and referred to various treatment programs. So there's a lot that's coming together now because we've learned over the past several years of kinds of programs that we really do need. Of course, it's not everything, but it's 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 starting the, the pathway of what works. And I must say the U.S. Supreme Court decision um, just recently, which gives the, the counties or the local jurisdictions the um, authority to create their own law and follow their own law in terms of moving homeless or, or yeah, homeless into better places. So that's going to help a lot because we have these programs, but in the past, we weren't able to move them to the program because if a person says they don't want to go, they don't want to go, even if they would be helped and they can't make the decision about whether they go or not. Um, the police, the social workers, outreach workers could not move them. But now with this new um, authority, I think we're going to see much better results and helping the homeless to get to better places. Mm, that's good. Well, you know, it sounds very progressive. It sounds like the real action was taken uh, and real money was spent. And we'll get to that when we talk about, let's see, you have discussed what? A homelessness and what about housing. affordable housing? What, what's housing. the drill down on that one? That's a 230 million to build infrastructure to allow them. Oh, also there are two bills that passed. I mean, it's not money, but it it's authority. Um, is the ADUs, the... Um, um, what is that called? Uh, the uh, hmm, the dwelling unit um, where you can build two houses, up to two houses on your, your urban area, your urban lot. Um, that passed. And so the counties now will be required to look at um, um, how they can allow for uh, people with lots to then add on. You were telling us about homelessness. What about um, you know affordable housing? What happened there? Okay, so what I said earlier was that two hundred thirty million dollars is set aside for affordable housing, and this would what they call the dwelling unit revolving fund, which is paying for infrastructure. So if you pay for infrastructure, then the cost of construction would come down. Uh, so we're looking at that. We're also putting money into um, the the um, rental revolving fund. So there's funds put it, put in to build additional housing. Uh, there's also two bills, and I, I believe in home rule. So these two bills I, I, I supported, um, although there was a lot of controversy behind that. Um, one is the assisted dwelling unit, um, ADUs, assisted dwelling unit um, zoning for um, allowing counties, the or, uh, authorizing the counties to to be able to, um, in, in urban areas where there are lots, to be able to zone um, zone those lots for two additional units on that same lot. So increasing the pool of housing that would be available. Um, and the second bill, um, and that was um, Senate Bill 3202, and another bill, Senate Bill 2919, was the one that authorizes the county to um, deal with short-term rentals. So they can prohibit short-term rentals. They can uh, develop a, um, regulations on short-term rentals so that you can increase, again, increase the pool for housing for residents. 
not for investment. So those mm -hmm. two are, are, are two bills that not money behind them, but regulatory and allows authorization to, um, to have more options to, to, to develop or to keep the pool of housing available for people to live in, not invest in. To, to what extent uh, could this, will this uh, uh, help uh, the recovery of Maui? I think tremendously. I mean, you, you saw right on the heels of the governor signing that bill on the short-term rentals, Mayor Brisson was already, you know, with, with a bill to, to his county council. So it will help because a lot of their housing that was built for workforce housing, as I understand, um, was was being rented out as short-term rentals. And, you know, you could make buco bucks with short-term rentals it's day yeah. by day. Good, good steps. Um, let's talk about uh, tax relief. That that got a lot of press, and you mentioned it and supported it and all that. Um, and you know, uh, uh, how much how much relief and how, what's that going to cost the state? And where where's the intersection between that and the money that the legislature authorized for housing? Okay, well, that's that's a complex question. Um, so let me, let me start with the tax relief program. It is the biggest tax cut ever in the history of the state. Um, and, and this, this was percolating and, and it actually didn't really come together to almost the last days of the legislature. It, it was complicated. There's two parts to this tax relief bill. And this was ultimately to help the Alice family, the, the, um, asset limited, income constrained earners, they're working poor. Um, we were increasing their minimum wage, as you know, we in increased it last session, the session before, and it was incremental. But each year that the minimum wage was being increased, their earnings would push them into another income bracket. So mm -hmm. whatever they made was lost. And, and the more they make, it's going to be lost. So we really needed to look at some way in which this is all integrated. So how do you let them keep more in their of the, the paycheck in their their you know so that they can use as discretionary income or to pay for whatever? So so this bill has two parts. That one is um, the uh, standard deduction. It's it's increased so that. Um, and I, I you know there's there are figures like 4,400 to 8,800, and it, it it's incrementally increased uh, over time. And the second part of it is that, um, which is this, um, the income tax bracket. So the lowest income tax bracket is now 4,400 dollars for a couple or family. So 4,400. If you make more in your minimum wage, it will lift you up because at, at over 4,400, you're paying taxes. As minimal as it is, you're paying taxes. So this has been increased. So if you make 19, this coming year, if you make 19,000 or less, you don't get taxed. So it really does lift up the wages for the lowest bracket. And it really shouldn't be paid taxes on $19,000 a year. This, this coming year, it doubles. So instead of the 4,400 for joint filers this past year, as it has been, it will be $8,800. And over time, every two years, so that by 2030, the joint filers, the standard deduction will be $24,000. So you look at that increase over time, the standard deduction. Talk about the cost of this to the state. The cost to the state over the six year, seven year period will be $1.3 billion. $1.3 billion. But the way that they've phased it in over the seven year period is incremental every two years. And in the meantime, what the governor and the legislature is asking the governor to do is look at how you streamline government. How do you pay for services that are needed? How do you eliminate the, the, the positions that you don't need? You know, we have about 4,000 vacant positions in the state. Wow. 
And so the last thing I've seen from the governor's office is asking all of his departments to look at all of their vacant positions and those positions that have been empty for the last four or five years to eliminate it or consolidate it so we can pay people more to do a better job of what, what the community needs. So it's gonna be a real restructuring of uh, and some departments more than others. That's the hope is that what we should have done during the pandemic, which we asked the previous governor to do, was look at restructuring government, look at what's really needed and eliminate those positions that are just on the books forever. And you can't, you can't really fill them because they're so archaic, some of them. And they're still on the books collecting. You know, this is very helpful because reorganizing government obviously makes it more efficient. Yeah. It makes it cheaper. So remember the third part of my question was um, how, you know, how does the, the tax relief, the, the tax cut um, interact with the fact that you had to give money for affordable housing, you, you, had, you have, you know, um, un, sort of an unpredictable amount you have to spend now and later on, on re, you know, rebuilding Maui. Um, if you give a tax cut, you have less money, but if you make government more efficient, you have more money. So tell me how that all works. What's the analysis there? Very important to reorganize that way. Yeah. And goodness gracious, you can save a ton of money that way. Because one thing I did do when I was government operations is that we we went to some of these departments. And I tell you, it's, it's a safety hazard too, because they had all this paper sky high in their little cubicles. <laughs> and I was saying, what is this? Oh, these are files. I said, what? what are these files for like current cases? Oh no, some of these are old, but we never got around to it. I never got around to it to take these files and and send them off to um you know to the warehouse. But this is taking up real estate when you could actually have more bodies in there, staff in there instead of paper. So you know, part of this is how do you either digitize or take this to the warehouse and and move it out so that we have space for people and we can bring people back millions of dollars that we spend to lease um, private sector space when we could have it all on, on our own property. So, you know, there's so many ways that I think we've just been sloppy about it. So if we look at that and the governor is really, really faithful to his promise to really look at streamlining government, it's also paper and waste and like that. Well, any new computer system is going to save money. Um, and if the state can do that, whatever money it invests in a new computer system will be rewarded many times over for a long time. You know, you mentioned about uh, Kupuna long term care, Sharon. And I wonder if you could tell us what happened there and, uh, you know, what, what, the, what the provisions of the bill or bills were. Yeah, it's it's really an important area that's been neglected. You know, the when we start to look at this, because we're having so many more frail elders and, and, you know, nursing homes, because of the higher standards the feds are expecting of them, they don't have enough staff. So they may have empty beds there that our kupuna can use, but they can't because their staffing levels are too low. So they keep the beds empty. So we, you know, I said we. I, so I'm co co convener of the Kupuna Caucus. So I said let's let's look at this. And so the feds are looking at that as well. Um, of how do you have more community based services because it's so costly to put them and build nursing homes. So um, so we put together um, a working group um, about a year and a half ago, and we kept on moving forward with that and. Uh, we had a summit last February, and the the outshot of that is that we decided to move to have a long term care plan, a master plan, so we can plan forward because you know the numbers are still small enough, but it's growing, and we should be ahead of the curve instead of behind it. So we came up with um, a long term care. Well, at least a bill to establish a long-term care plan. And, you know, in the process of studying this and doing research of what the office has done and, you know, going back, um, Jeanette Takamura was 
I think the first or one of the first um, executive office on aging directors. And she started a, a long-term care plan. She had a long-term care plan. It was adopted by the agency in 1988. And nothing has been done since. Oh, no, no, no. I know. I know. <laughs> the agency, the agency has done parts of it. You know, they have a Kupuna Care program and they have parts of it, you know, in terms of programs. But the plan itself, you know, did we do this? Did we do this? No. So we're now dusting it off. And she has a group, um, Jack Lewin. He's, he's like the master planner for healthcare. care. Uh, we've got the, the Office of Healthcare Assurance that people who license the, the nursing homes and care homes and uh, the executive office on aging coming together and, and dusting off that plan and saying, what if this do we need to keep? What if this do, you know, it is, it needs to be deleted and new things added in. So this coming year, hopefully by October, they can have the framework for that plan and what they need so that in the coming year, we can start, you know, fleshing it out and getting more services in those areas, especially long-term care. So this year we did do some things, um, working with uh, Judy Moore Peterson, who's the MedQuest administrator. Uh, we were able to increase um, the Medicare, uh, the Medicaid um, reimbursements to nursing homes, to uh, health healthcare providers uh, who service uh, the community-based programs for uh, Kupuna and, and daycare homes, day, day um, health homes uh, or centers. And so we're slowly starting to catch up. And do you know that what they have was is called a personal needs allowance. That is all the, the seniors or the frail that are in nursing homes get a personal needs allowance. They get a little bit of allowance money that they could buy things that they need while they're in the nursing home. It's theirs to you, you know, whatever they want to buy. Candy. No, not candy. <laughs> Something that's, you know, that they need. Well, that since forever has been $25 a month. So we, hooray, hooray, we raised it, doubled it. It's now $50 a month. <laughs> so I hope... <laughs> <laughs> and we're so happy we raised it for fifty dollars a month. Those poor seniors. <laughs> well, you know, taking care of the kupuna, making their lives worthwhile, is so important. It's just like a measure of the of, of the moral compass of the state. And I'm so glad you're attending to that because otherwise, it's it's sort of tragic for a lot of kupuna, and and this this helps them you know enjoy their lives. That's important. One of the other things, let me just share, because, you know, because of the workforce shortage, uh, we focused one bill on healthcare providers, you know, the what they call the certified nurse assistants. These are the people at the lowest le level, you know, they come in, they change their bedpans, they, they're, they're the, the sweetest people because they're the direct, they're, they're like the, the direct line, you know, direct workers, right, your, your first responders, so to speak. Um, and, you know, you don't want to be doing that forever. So um, one of the um, bills that we passed, and it was with Hawaii Health Associate, Healthcare Association of Hawaii, um, to train uh, high school kids to learn how to uh, care, do health care. And so they can come in, learn some of these kinds of skills, and um, get interested in serving. You know, it takes a special person, but serving elders and learning uh, healthcare skills. Um, and also the certified nurse assistants, um, working with the community college, training them to become uh, licensed practical nurses. So there's a career ladder now. So you can come in, do this work, but knowing that you know, you're gonna move up, you learn your skills and you move up, which then can create a larger pool to bring in the workers that we need. So I'm really excited about that because we did have a pilot program on Maui with Wes Lowe and his um, um, uh, nursing home. And, and it's worked and we've gotten people really excited about getting into healthcare. So, um, yeah. Again, you've got to help them. And you've, you know, we're all gonna be there someday. We want the state to respect uh, the elder people in our community in every way it can. There was a bill, wasn't there, that um, 
that encouraged doctors to stay here by exempting um, what receipts for medical practice from gross excise tax. This, is, this has been yeah. something that's been cooking a long time and they've been asking for it a long time and, and a lot of doctors have been leaving. So what happened on that one? Senate Bill 1035. And, and the current situation before this bill got signed into law as Act 47 by the governor this past couple weeks ago, um, the docs and dentists practicing um, pra pra practitioners in the community would have to pay the GET tax on their services rendered. Docs in the hospital or in um, these qualified um, um, health centers didn't have to pay the GET tax. So what this bill does is, is exempts those docs outside in the community, which are the ones that are in rural areas, serving Medicaid, Medicare, TRICARE patients, the vulnerable, um, allows them to service those beneficiaries without paying the GET. They're exempted from the GET, similar to docs in the hospital. So it's gonna be big time help uh, because a lot of the docs and dentists came around lobbying us and saying, you know, it's really, we wanna serve them, but we really can't afford it because it's like double taxation, right? They gotta serve and 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 pay, make it a lower amount that they, they serve. And then they gotta pay taxes upon what they get. So it, it did pass and it is now law. Oh, that's great. I, I, I'm sure that, that the, all those uh, small practices, you know, the small independent doctors must love it because I know that they have felt um, oh, years, um, you know, yeah. a lot of economic pressure over that issue. So <laughs> let's talk about the Kaka'ako Makai coastline. That came up a couple of years ago and um, it was preserved. Let me say that was good. But what about what about now? Uh, what what was the uh, what was what was the legislative action on that issue now? Okay, I, I do have to give credit to Speaker Psyche because he, we need both of us. So he, so I wasn't able to really stave off a lot in terms of the 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 OHA's attempts to um, to change the law, which now prohibits. Uh, any residential high-rise luxury or any other residential building on the Mackay shoreline. Um, and and it, it went through the house and, and the house didn't pass it out. So that was a year, not this year, but a year before. This session, nothing came up, but I'm, um, and, but we did pass a law, two things happened. One, we passed a law that for any development in Kaka'ako, the developer must address sea level rise and climate change. So they need to come up with what have they considered in terms of their building, their project that will address these high tides and, and you know what, what's happening with the coastline. So that's a good thing because it's, it's now in law. So not only they can't build residential high rises, but they can't build without considering what is underneath, what, it, what is the impact of of the high waves or you know king tides or whatever that's that's number number two what has since happened is that the hawaii community development authority which is a zoning authority for kaka'ako they finally uh after all these years the board um adopted the rule that that mirrors the state law so you can't build residential high rise in Mackay. And you have to stay within the height limit, which is I think the max in Mackay is something like 200 feet, I think. And, and the density is, is limited. So, um, so that's two really important developments that would be hard for any, any developer to, to get past that without some real heavy duty um, planning and uh, meeting those regs. The third thing that I'm really pleased about, and I, I do um, a newsletter, um, e-newsletter every other week. And I went to interview um, uh, the new OHA CEO. Uh, her name is Stacy Ferreira. I know Stacy because I worked with her because she was the budget chief in WAM. 
um, and she just got appointed last December. And she knows that we, we've got to guard <laughs> any high-rise development in Mackay unless she has some good reason. But but what was really a pleasant surprise was that four years ago, OHA adopted a strategic plan. That strategic plan was to look at um, cultural um um, helping the stability of the Native Hawaiians uh, and looking at ways in which they could do more to help their beneficiary housing, affordable housing, not luxury housing, affordable housing. So it was um, gratifying to talk with her that for Makai, they still don't have a plan, but they are planning. Uh, and she has a cultural um, director. She's got an administrator. It's a very it's turning into, to, I think, and I guess the proof is in the pudding, a much more professional organization. And they're supposed to execute this plan that was adopted four years ago. So, so she's really taking it seriously and looking at those components of the plan. And it's not on building high-rise luxury condos. It's really looking at affordable housing. And she still has to do, do, um, hire a um, housing director. But in the meantime, she says in the next couple of months, they're gonna look at all their land assets and they're gonna look at how best to use their assets. So they, I don't think they've ever done an inventory like that to look at what is the best use of everything that they own, you know, from statewide. So um, it's very, promising i mean i don't know what proof as i say proof is in the pudding but but she's um she has integrity um she she really um she's she's done strategic planning for kamehameha schools uh she's she's really done um um a lot of planning kinds of things that i'm i'm hopeful uh and so you know when i interviewed her which was last last Monday, I guess. I said, well, I, if you folks develop anything or have anything, I want to keep coming back to get what's the rundown of where you are in your planning for Kaka'ako Makai. So I, I um, people, you know, are distrustful of OHA. And, um, and so she knows that. So she's trying to build the credibility up. So, um, so um, I interviewed her and it's, it, the interview is in my um, e-message this past week. Uh, and already I got comments back. Well, how do you know? You can't trust them. <laughs> what are you talking about? What do you know what you're talking about? <laughs> and what is that? You say she's done all these things, but really, what has she really done? <laughs> it's so generic. <laughs> the ballots are out, Sharon. The ballots for OHA are out. And uh, all we can do is urge people to educate themselves on who's running and and that's make right. intelligent choices uh, in voting right. for the OHA trustees. That's right. That's right. I mean, to really look at your trustees rather than continue um, trustees who have not really looked at what their their mission is to take care of the Native Hawaiian beneficiaries, the people, all the Native Hawaiian people. And, you know, how much of that have they done? I, I must say she mentioned a couple of projects that recently, recently, uh, OHA, um, has a has approved one is a grant to farmers to farmers um, to help them to pay for some of their expenses so that the money that they save they can plow back into their their business so that they can actually be sustained uh, and so some of these kinds of things never before have you heard of you know oha doing this they just did little grants here and there they do pr here and there but but this is really solid so i i'm hopeful that you know as as I work with the police, I say, you know what? You can't be so negative. If somebody has a sp even a spark that they're going to do something that's positive for people, you know, just support that, build this, make that spark grow, right? So I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful. You have two terms under your belt. Um, you spent a lot of time in energy before you and I knew each other. Then um, yeah, good you, time, old you, days, good days. You, you were on the uh, what uh, the government operations committee. I thought that was really a valuable experience, especially when we're talking about fiscal policy. 
Um, and now you're, uh, you're what, vice chair of Ways and Means. That's a very, very important job. And, you know, you bring a lot of experience and talent to all of that. Um, and to hear you talk about these issues, it's really encouraging. So, um, you know, the, the, the state has a million issues to handle. We have to be as Akamai as we possibly can. Um, and I think you're well prepared for that. So I understand you're running again. Tell us why you're running again and whether you're masochistic about it or what. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, Jay, you remember when I first ran, it was because of the high rise condos and and uh, our senator at the time, you know, could care less what the community thought. I was in the community. And so so my neighbor said, you know, we got to we got to fend for ourselves. We got to we got to run somebody. He said he said to us, oh, if you don't like what I'm doing, then you run. So my neighbor said, OK, you run. <laughs> so it started. That way. <laughs> that I was going to be the voice. OK, I'll be the voice for our community. And um, and I think that, you know, I've, I've stayed in touch with my neighbors, with with even more people on, on really local local problems like homeless or crime or noise, uh, because I feel that's my job. I work for them. I uh, represent them. I'm their voice in the Senate, in the legislature. So it's really grounded in that kind of issues. But I tell them, you know, people don't care about our little community. We have to look at those issues and say that, what about what we do? Like Waikiki, you don't care about Waikiki. Um, we have to say it's a model for any place else in the state that has has uh, beach erosion, that has to deal with sea level rise. So we have to make it broader so I can get my colleagues to say, hey, that's a good idea. Maybe we should try that out. So, so that's the fun part, Jay, of this job is you can do whatever you want um, and you got to convince, you know, the majority of others to go along and the governor or the administration. But the, the opportunities are there to really solve problems. And they're complex problems. And homelessness, that's one of my priorities. Uh, uh, Long-term care, that's another of my priorities. But these are all for vulnerable people that that nobody really wanted to handle before because it was too complex and, you know, it's too much to do and too costly. But if you nip at it and you have a big plan, you say you go day by day, like you say, every day better, um, people come on board. And, and we have in three years and end homelessness, we have an Office of Homeless and Housing Solution. It's a statewide office. We're building Kalhali, you know, and it started with people not even talking to each other from the prosecutor, the, the police to the courts. Now they're all talking with each other and we're finding solutions that work. And, and and these are all committed people. They're all doing good jobs in their lane, but the lanes weren't connecting. So it's fun and it's really exciting to see that you can make a difference. So that's why I'm running. Well, Sharon, you're doing a good job. So you got to carry on. We want you to carry on because you, you have this notion of being steward for the state. Taking, taking all of these things into account and trying to make it a better place for everybody. And in a word, caring. I always enjoyed that part of your literature. And I do believe you care. Anything else you want to say before we close? You know, you mentioned it before. OHA has people running. Um, we all are running, not all, some of us. <clears throat> but it's, it's, it's also, I ask my, my constituents, when you see a problem, report it. If you have ideas, let me know. We in the interim work on these problems. We do some research. Some of the ideas are cockamamie. We can't do it. Some other <laughs> ideas are good. I, I'll tell you one example. I mean, if you have a little bit of time, uh, because it's, it really was exciting. So we wanted the safe and sound for Waikiki because we had these people with 40 arrests. They're habitual offenders. They come in, they go, and they release. The police tell me it's catch and release, catch and release. These are the habitual offenders. They accost people. People are so afraid to walk at night or in the day. Uh, so, but so should the community. You know, if things are happening, they should let us know because um, all of this is really a full time civic duty. Because all of us 
we can't just say, oh, well, you know, this, the homeless are back. Well, the homeless are back, so report it, or let's look at how we can get the homeless to a better place. But but it's not somebody else's problem. It's our problem. Like what I always say, we, we are the government, and the government is us. And we have to be part, you know, of, of the um, comprehensive community. And I, I think that's the way you think. That's the way we all ought to think. It's, it's not just a matter of voting or not voting. A lot of people don't vote, and that's really too bad. But your civic duty goes beyond just voting. You have to be a player in the whole process. So one of my constituents, John Deutzman, he, he watches this and he shows all these pictures of these nasty looking people and he sends it to the mayor, he sends it to everybody. Uh, but, but John came up and he said, you know, there's that habitual property offender bill and we can do something like that. And I think that Miami or wherever, why can't we do a bill like that? So last session, um, we worked on a bill. I worked with the prosecutor's office and said, okay, how can we frame this so it's the same? And so now we have a, a habitual, we have a habitual property offender bill, but it's a habitual, a habitual violent offender bill. These are people who accost people all the time and they're smart. They know I can do this. It's a misdemeanor. It's a misdemeanor. So they catch and release, catch and release. So you could have 40 of these, but they're all misdemeanors. They don't add up. So this bill that we introduced um, says if you do the same kind of offenses, bodily injury against a person or the police or, or um, domestic violence, all of these actions, if there are three that you do in a five-year period, it pushes up to a felony, a class C felony, which means you can go to jail. You can go for a, five years and you can get $5,000 of fine. That bill had the hardest time to pass. I had to really negotiate with the House to get that bill passed. And so it passed, but it passed with a three-year sunset. So now each year, now I'm trying to work with the prosecutor, how do you collect the metrics to show that this is effective in reducing crime? So, but that bill was signed by the governor. And that that was a major, no money, but major, major undertaking to get the House to agree. And, and now we have a bill that if these people come in, it'll cost you three times. And so I told, I told all of my constituents, you, you complain about the police not doing this, not enforcing. You have to be part of the solution. When that happens, you have to report it. Don't just say, oh, they're not going to care. You have to report it because once they get three, in a five-year period, now the prosecutor can take it to court and bank it and, and get them to, to start. It's a deterrent, right? Once you do a couple of cases like that, it's a deterrent. So yes, it does work. So I say, number one, let us know if you have good ideas. Number two, like you said with OHA and all of us, go look at what the record is. Go see what they're doing and, and ask us to do stuff. And if we don't do stuff, now you have evidence that we should be or shouldn't be there representing you. <laughs> so you got to do your homework too, people. <laughs> yeah, true. There are so many other bills that um, you know we've heard of during this session, and I wish we had more time. Uh, there are some really interesting bills, and I'm sure you're aware of all of them, but um, maybe we'll have to cover it in some other show. Um, but uh, I would like to try to keep people informed about what's cooking at the legislature, not only during the session, but after the session and for the next session. Well, thank you so much, uh, Senator Sharon Moriwaki of the Hawaii State Senate, for your work and your caring. And I hope we can do this again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. I like your programs because it does bring out the community and, and the community responsibility. So thank you. Mahalo. Aloha. Mahalo.